I'm Bill Carlson with Catholic on Tampa, and uh, we're doing another one of our online interviews this afternoon, this time with Dominic Calabro, who's the uh, president and CEO of uh, Florida Tax Watch. Dominic, uh, welcome and thank you. He's calling in from Tallahassee today, uh, staying safe at home. Dominic, tell us uh, about Florida Tax Watch, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Bill. Really appreciate you and uh, enjoy Cafe Con, Con Tampa. Uh, this is wonderful. Uh, Florida Tax Watch has just uh, enjoyed its 40th anniversary as the watchdog, bird dog, and guide dog, not a lap dog for the taxpayers of Florida, all the taxpayers. It's been founded by Florida's premier business and civic leaders. It's nonpartisan, nonprofit. Its whole purpose is really to be the eyes and the ears of the taxpayers, to look out for the short and especially long-term interest to see that taxpayers get a better bang for their buck from state government, city, county, school districts, and the like. Appreciate your great service as a commissioner with the city of Tampa, as well as being a longstanding member of the Florida Tax Watch Board of Trustees. So for some 40 years, Tax Watch has been an advisor, has prompted changes constitutionally, state laws, Tax Watch led on the repeal of the intangibles tax, on major tax increases or tax changes, Tax Watch has led on helping create more value for taxpayers, improving citizen understanding, and helping to uh, create more accountability at Florida state and local government so that taxpayers have a more prosperous and healthy uh, environment with which to live, work, and do business. And you've got a you've got a who's who board. I think I'm one of the least of the board members, but um, <laughs> no, you know, you're yeah. you're prominent. But we we do we really have been very very fortunate, very blessed. Uh, in fact, it was founded uh, some uh, one of the first meetings we had. Um, it was really the, the six founders of Florida, the Citizens Council for Budget Research, which was a forerunner, forenamed organization prior to Florida Tax Watch in 1979-1980, was really founded by Ken Plant, a Republican, Phil Luce, a Democrat, who's so always bipartisan, looking out for the best long-term interests of the citizens of Florida. But it's really the Florida families. It was uh, founded by, with Mark Hollis, later became president, then vice chairman of public supermarkets, with the founder, Mr. George Jenkins, which at the time, Publix was a much smaller uh, grocery uh, store and grocery chain than Winn-Dixie. So J.E. Davis was the chairman of Winn-Dixie. His nephew, uh, Wayne Davis, was very uh, involved in founding Tax Watch. So the, the, the six founders were uh, J.E. Davis of Winn-Dixie, T. Wayne Davis of Winn-Dixie, uh, Mr. George Jenkins, the founder of Publix, and uh, Mark Hollis. Later, we got Barney Barnett and the, and the very uh, active Jenkins family. Very and active. In the Tampa Bay, you have uh, former mayor, former governor, Bob Martinez. We're going to great, uh, great leaders of our state and uh, great, great, uh, absolutely. So we've had the Likes family very, very, very involved for many, many years and getting reactivated again. So tax and also Charlie blessed. Gray uh, has been involved, was involved for a long time. He, he, he still is. He still is. Yeah. So we've got really the preeminent business civic leaders. And the beauty of it is these are the men and women. Uh, former chair is uh, Michelle Robinson. She was actually from Tampa for many, many years. Uh, she was the right. president of... Verizon, and uh, now is a president for 20 different states throughout the so Tell us about, tell one of the things that you all do is um, you put out the Turkey's Award. So these are things that you think that the legislature shouldn't fund. And I think sometimes the governor listens, sometimes he doesn't. Um, but uh, what, what are some of the big accomplishments you're proud of for Tax Watch over the last 20 years or so? Well, I, I would say that the, the turkey list is, is a very small part of what we do, but it is important because it's it's very bold. I mean, there's no one in the state, no one in the country that does it. One reason, Florida has a line item veto. Uh, we've had, uh, the average is about two out of three, about 67 to 70% of the recommend the items on that turkey list generally get vetoed by governors, whether Democratic or Republican through the years, um, adding some three to $4 billion over the 30 plus years of our 40 years of existence, um, but that's not the biggest. I think the biggest, that's kind of established our independence, established our credibility. There's a lot of integrity involved. We even had our sitting chairman have one of uh, his or her projects on that list. And uh, so it shows a lot of integrity. To I think the, the basic, thing about, basic thing about Tax Watch, you, you work on citizenship and a lot of other things, but the basic thing is that if it looks like government, state government, federal government, mainly state, local government is wasting money, you'll jump in and do a study and, and prove it because you want to try to save taxpayer money. And whether you're on the left or the right, if you're on the right, you might want taxes to be reduced. 
Uh, if you're on the left, you might want other services to be for the, for the money to. That's uh, exactly correct. Not no, that's exactly in correct. Favor of yeah. Government efficiency, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you, you think so? The problem is that no one wants it enough to you know make a lot of investments in it. So our role is say, here's how we can translate government efficiency, better government, and how if you want to lower taxes, if you're as you said maybe on the right, you want to lower taxes. The only way you can do it without cutting core functions is to be more efficient. If you want to serve citizens better, more effectively, more efficiently, then cut out the waste and put those monies to more productive uses. So whether you're on we've left got or a right, bunch of people, we've key. got a bunch of people listening online and um, just as a cafe on Tampa, um, as usual, if you have any questions or comments, you can post them in the comments underneath the, uh, the live feed here and we'll try to get to them. Uh, Dominic, give us your take on the Florida economy pre uh, crisis. So what was happening with the Florida economy? What were the strengths and weaknesses of it? And, and, uh, and you know, where do you think we're headed before this crisis? And then we'll talk about the crisis in a few minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Florida economy was uh, the 16th, uh, if not the 17th largest economy in the world, if you were to count Florida as a state among the other nations. Uh, we had 1.1 trillion, that's a thousand, $1,100 billion uh, worth of gross domestic product. We were hitting on virtually all cylinders. It was still a little residual unemployment in some of the counties of Florida that didn't recover from the 2008-9 uh, Great Recession. But by and large, our economy was heated from all of the major sectors. Uh, we were just looking to expand and to grow. We were third largest state population, uh, third or fourth most highest gross domestic product in the, in the nation. So we were hitting on really all, all fronts. Uh, one thing I'd have to say, though, is, you know, Governor DeSantis has done a remarkable job, a, a good job. I mean, he's in a really tough spot. Some say, you, you, you know, open Florida up. Some say don't open it up. I mean, kind of you, you, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. But I think he's trying to use as much evidence as possible to determine when's the best place, because so you got to be careful. The cure is not, is not going to kill the patient in the meantime. Before we get to the to the COVID nineteen uh, current crisis, tell us if you could wind back the clock ten years ago. So let's say uh, two thousand nine, two thousand ten, we're emerging from the Great Recession. If you could wind back the clock, uh, what would you recommend that Florida do differently um, if we if we could go back in time? You know, the one area I think that Florida's always been a little bit vulnerable is the quality and the pay of jobs. And I don't think the answer is necessarily, you know, a arbitrary minimum uh, forced pay rate. But it's to, to create uh, through education and, and better tying um, the availability of jobs because we had an unemployment rate, uh, 2.8, one of the lowest, actually the lowest in the nation, one of the lowest in Florida's history, period. Years ago, when I was in college or graduate school, we would say anything below 5% or lower was, you know, full employment. So we were down to almost half of that. And we still had a lot of, uh, as many as unemployed people, we had about 228,000. We had about 350,000. Uh, unfilled jobs throughout Florida. So it was really a disconnect between skills, ability, talents, and those that, uh, that had different kinds of skills and talents. So it's trying to merge those two together. And I think that's something that we're, we know it, we just have to do a better job of it. And that would have also ultimately increased median household income so that it's not only that there's nothing wrong with starting jobs, but you want to be able to give people an opportunity if they show aptitude, they show willingness, to grow, and that's really what Tax Watch does. Is say, how can we use improve our education system? We're working with Tax Watch has a principal leadership awards program that uses empirical evidence to recognize, reward, and replicate excellence among our elementary principals, middle school principals, and high school principals. That uses evidence that's unlike anything else in the state and in the country. That uh, shows here's how we can improve student academic achievement, particularly at the most challenging the most difficult schools where English is spoken as a second language. You've got a lot in Hillsborough County, you know, obviously a lot in Southeast Florida as well, um, where um, a disproportionate number of them are on free and reduced lunch and where they've got a lot of disabilities. So these are the principals who are kind of knocking it out of the park. They need to be rewarded and recognized. Tax Force gives them money, gives them recognition. And we also give scholarships to each of these nine. We get three elementary, three middle school, three high school principals. They're public, which include public charters, to make sure that um, we reward excellence. Because if you can do it there, you can kind of do it anywhere. What else? And we're now trying to replicate that. Going back in time again, for anybody who's just gone on, if you, um, if you went back to 2009, 2010, and could look ahead, 
you talked about the gap between um, the unemployment rate. I was taught the same thing, the natural rate of unemployment around 5% and what were we two and a half or three. Sure. Um, if, if we could go back in time though, the people that didn't have jobs or were underemployed, what else besides focusing on K through 12, what else do you think we could have done to, to put more people to work or, I think, or to help them get higher wages? Yeah, I think the real issue is, is uh, rather than so much credentials is, is maybe put a little less emphasis for a lot of people to get a college degree. I mean, a lot of them have big college debt. And in fact, the worst double whammy is when they go to college and have tens of thousands, sometimes over a hundred thousand dollars of student debt, uh, and they don't even complete their degree. I mean, then you really hit double whammy where they don't really have employable skills, if you will. So sometimes the certificate degrees, the, the what we used to call vocational ed, but they're really uh, credential, but they're, they're more in terms of specific things from the trades, but also computing, uh, coding, and those kind of things where there's a demand today and going to grow exponentially in the future. So that's, that's a really big one. And I also make sure we do a better job of connecting them. The other area, I think, is to really empower, as tax which is really showing now, principal leaders. So I think that's really, really critically important. The other one is I think we made a big mistake getting caught in this, this vortex of a, of a silly notion a uh, politically uh, silly idea that collecting the remote sales and use tax, which is the law of the land, the use tax, is somehow a tax increase. It's not. I think if we've been collecting that now, we would have billions of dollars um, that we would make sure we don't, we would remove a big impediment bill that we have. We're giving other non-residents, people outside the country, even China, can sell into Florida markets, into Tampa, Hillsborough, St. Pete, everywhere throughout the, the whole Hillsborough and Tampa markets that have a six to seven and may in some cases 8% cost advantage that they're not paying the sales and use tax, but they're invading our markets and putting our own brick and mortar employees at a great, great competitive disadvantage. We need to collect it, remit that tax. We can use those tax dollars, which are probably close to a billion dollars the very first year. By the second, third, fourth year, we're probably talking about two, two and a half billion dollars that we can use to enrich early learning, our our K to 12 public schools and public charters, and particularly those degree programs and, uh, and, and some of the community colleges or college systems and uh, our universities. What would we so, need to do? What would we need to do? Is it enforcement or is it the legislative change? How, what would we need to do to collect that? There's 45 states that have a sales and use tax. There's five states that do not. Uh, Florida is one of the only seven states that does not have a state personal income tax or even a local personal income tax. But 45 states that have a sales and use tax have um, already complied with the U.S. Supreme Court decision called Wayfair. Wayfair was enacted in June of eight, 2018 that said, uh, here's a way South Dakota has been collecting the, the, the sales, the re remote sales tax, if you will, um, and done so legally, properly, and it wasn't a big burden on, on consumers. What we're really trying to do is remove the liability from your listeners, okay, from your audience, people, Sometimes they buy things over the internet, buy it from eBay, buy it from, um, you know, Amazon and the resellers at Amazon. And they're actually tax, maybe tax sheets inadvertently. So the burden now falls on them where those other 43 states, they remove the burden from the consumer, the user to the large out of state, out of country remote seller. It's really a good form of tax reform. It reduces the liability. People won't be responsible for collecting it. The big, large, foreign uh, retailer that says sells millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars into Florida markets would at least put our employees at at least competitive, uh, remove that competitive advantage that they currently have, have a, and we'll have a lot of money. Do you have a breakout by county and city? Have you all disseminated that? We, we don't. We probably could, could put that down by region, uh, but I mean, we can guesstimate based on the total uh, revenue. If we break down a billion dollars, we can kind of figure out roughly what kind of Markets, but I mean, you can have a lot in Tampa. T Tampa, Hillsborough community, tremendous amount of money that people get invading markets. And this is the time to do it. We're, our brick and mortars are just wrenched through this whole pandemic. They need a really good boost in the arm. This could be it because it's not a new tax. It's si simply enforcing. It's almost like you're saying, look, the Department of Revenue would have a uh, tax, uh, uh, not tax free day, but, but just a time to allow taxpayers that were once delinquent say, here's the time to come back and pay pay your taxes. They were not paying it unlawfully, and now they're paying it. 
That's not a new tax. That's just compliance with the tax laws. That's all we're calling for. So the tax what you're is saying is that it, through this pandemic, more and more people have been buying online. And if, uh, if it, when, when this ends, hopefully soon, the uh, pe people will start going to brick and mortar uh, facilities again. And if those brick and mortars are charging the 8% or whatever local governments are charging, th then, and then somebody online is not, that's a big difference uh, in margin. And it's a big difference um, for, uh, for in selling something, right? It could really be, a, as you said, a double whammy for the local retailers. Yeah, we want to help, we want to help uh, Tampa, uh, Hillsborough County residents and small businesses. This is the, the lifeblood. And so we have to get our heads out of this ideological thinking and be pragmatic and actually follow a rule of law. The most important thing is this is the rule of law. All we're trying to do is help remove the lawful liability from the small senior citizen, small business owner to the big, large out-of-state remote seller so that we can collect money that's lawfully owed under the rule of law and then help do some real advantage. We may be able to use some of that revenue to lower taxes that are non-competitive, like the uh, sales tax on commercial rents or reduce the uh, telecommunications tax, the communication services tax. That is a very regressive tax on our elderly, our seniors, our working families and small businesses. So way, it also helps fund- anybody For anybody who's just um, logging in, if you have any questions, please post them to- uh, to Facebook underneath the live feed, and we're happy to try to get to them. Hey, um, so you, part of what we talked about at the beginning is Tax Watch also looks at government waste. So again, looking back the last 10 years, and then we'll shift to what's happening now. But looking back the last 10 years, what do you think are some of the big, maybe top two or three areas of government waste in Florida? Well, I, I think so many areas have been, and, and opportunities to, to, uh, to, to just reduce inefficiencies in our Public schools, there's, there are, they're very archaic. You know, we forget that. And Texas just published a recent report showing that, among all our public and private employers, our, our county school school district school boards are some of the largest employers. Yet they don't operate like enterprising businesses. Some of them are well over one, two, three, sometimes six, eight billion dollars a year annual businesses but they don't think and act like they don't use student transportation like uh, proper logistics. So they're spending collectively billions of dollars that's not very efficient. So tax watch has pointed out some school district uh, superintendents and school boards have been better at it than others. So there's great opportunities of reducing administrative costs and taking that savings and paying teachers more money, reducing uh, maybe even some cases the size of the classroom would, but also paying our principals more so and getting more money into instruction. Money that's spent outside the classroom, food service, janitorial, facilities, maintenance, IT, these things are commercial in nature, can be best done by people who know the logistics of doing them, take the savings with a very competitive framework that Tax Watch has recommended, and then the savings can be re-delivered and packaged only into the classroom where learning actually occurs. So any other big areas that you think that uh, Florida could have saved money or, or has wasted money, not just the state, but local governments, as you mentioned, in the last 10 years? Yeah, this is somewhat controversial if you're public employee, but if you're not, no, it's not. A really big area is going to be public pensions. Tax which has pointed us out repeatedly, and it's still probably now an opportunity to really look at this going forward. Um, you know, public pensions, even the Florida state pension system with our Florida retirement system, which includes state government employees, uh, county employees and certainly school district employees is uh, uh, the third or fourth largest in the country. We were seen as one of the better ones. We're now only the 15th best among the 50 states. One of the reasons is that we were funded at somewhere of 85, 86%, but that assumed a lot of things that the things would keep growing as they were. But now because of the downturn and the market valuation of stocks and bonds, which invest the money, we are now on the hook for probably down below 80%, about 78, 79%, and could very well be falling. But some of that assumes that we're going to get a rate of return of, you know, six and a half, seven percent a year for each of the next 30 years on average. That's not likely. It's going to be more like five, five and a half to maybe six. That differential would add even tens of billions more. So these underfunded pension systems do two things. They crowd out the uh, investment for real core functions and services, and they cost taxpayers money to pay for past service delivery, not the, not the future. So even the city of, of uh, Tampa, 
Hillsborough County and others. Uh, we've got to look at this. I think this is a great opportunity because frankly, yeah, we want to have a competitive system, but how many taxpayers, how many of your listeners really want to spend when a, for particularly a very generous system of, of, of tax? Let me give you a perfect example. Even a tax with a small nonprofit statewide organization, our annual budget is about two and a half million dollars. We spend about $100,000 a year for all of our employees for a defined contribution plan called Simplified Employee Pension. If we had just a modest defined benefit plan, like most, like the Florida retirement system, in most cities and counties, we would probably have to pay six to seven times as much on a retirement. Think about that. That's six to seven hundred thousand dollars instead of the hundred thousand we're currently spending, not on core functions, but just paying for past and and and, and current service. So hey, it's dominant. We it's got not, a question. It's not the right uh, thing. We got sorry, cut you off. We got a question. Um, do you think that the uh, retirement system investments are transparent? It's very hard. It, most, and, and it's not in, in terms of being trying to be hidden or, or malicious. It's just that pensions are stuff that it's like an iceberg. You don't really see, you only see the tip of that iceberg. The real liabilities, the real numbers are way, way down below. Your listeners is, uh, and uh, constituents is spot on. There's so much behind it. You really got to get under it and look at it very, very thoughtfully and carefully. Hey, let's pivot to um, the current situation. Uh, what kind of impact do you think this is having on the state of Florida right now and local governments? And what is uh, Tax Watch's recommendations regarding all that? Well, first of all, it's having a tremendous and tra traumatic. I mean, it's unprecedented impact. I mean, you know, it's, it's in some ways, it's been so sudden. So even though we had a very, very deep and long Great Recession that lasted, you know, some would argue six, seven years. And it was a long L response, not that normal V curve where it go down and go up. Uh, and it was very deep and very long because we lost confidence in our financial system. And there was a lot of questionable dealings with credit default swaps, credit agencies giving uh, insurance companies, you know, rate ratings they obviously did not deserve and there was no real basis for them. So it took a while. It was trillions of dollars, uh, 12, 14 trillion dollars nationally that was evaporated. But we didn't see as direct an impact on the economy. It did impact, it, it was longer. We're seeing one that when you shut down a state, you essentially shut down a vast majority of it, you're gonna look at reductions. We, we saw, and this is one reason why the, the state unemployment system crashed initially, it was, it's only designed to handle about a quarter million uh, unemployment applications uh, a month. We went from you know quarter million to three, three four times that are, you know, this could be millions of people um, nationwide, and even here in Florida, that will qualify. Now, even through efforts by the federal government and the, even the Federal Reserve to try to provide and encourage employers to keep employees employed, which is the one lesson they learned from 08-09, uh, it still had a dramatic effect because when you essentially pro prohibit people from conducting business, you're going to cost sales and use tax. For example, cars, truck sales constitute costs 15% of our uh, sales tax. Sales tax totally, uh, and if you look at the direct impact of tourism, hospitality, restaurants, lodging, uh, those kind of things, parks, they contribute 25 to 30%. So right there, you're, you're at having a dramatic impact on almost half of the sales tax collections. Sales tax could constitute 75 to almost 80% of our entire general revenue. So it's having a very, very dramatic impact. The problem is we don't know exactly because the, the data we got in, in late March or even early April is really for data that was for activities in, in February that went into March. So we really don't know precisely how deeply, but I think we should anticipate that it's going to be prepare for the worst and hope for the, hope for the better amount. So tax which is going to, is working with uh, our legislative leaders, our, our governor and executive branch to offer a, a range of solutions, suggestions that, that will best position Florida now, but also in the long term so we can keep our AAA bond rating. We can keep the constituents of Florida that need the services most protected, protected and make sure that whatever changes we make are those that we want to see continue. So we're looking at long term, use this as long term opportunity to make some changes on tax reforms, long term changes on on um, pensions and other things that make sense for Floridians for the long haul. It, let's say that, um, that the state is shut down through June and 
I'm not proposing that, but let's just say we're shut down through June. Do you have any idea? Uh, that would be two and a half months, uh, plus or minus. Do you have any idea what the total impact would be to the state budget? Any projections? Yeah, it, yeah it's, it's going to be billions, uh, billions and billions of dollars. Now, we've got to offset that by monies that the federal government has already uh, pledged, some of which is already sent to the states. So we're getting directly about $8.3 billion to state and local governments. Uh, cities of certain size can apply. Below that, uh, get it. But below that, they have to apply individually. So that's that's one of the rounds. We've got monies that are going to education. So the federal government has untapped the federal budget, if you will, in an unprecedented fashion, sending billions of dollars to state and local governments and, and to uh, education, our what? school districts and universities. So you got to factor some of that in. But long term, we've got to show one foot on the brake for spending. That's the good things. I know that Governor DeSantis and his team are already looking at and tax which helps to help and encourage those good things and offer maybe some additional suggestions. But these are times where we need to look at, you know, um, the remote sales issue, possibly the uh, gaming impact with uh, the uh, Seminole Indian tribe that could be 800 million to a billion dollars. There's just a number of things that we can do that's going to bring in money that actually does good for the long-term well-being. Does uh, TaxWatch have a set of recommendations or are you going to be um, proposing some and where would you put them? On your website or? Yes, we will. Yeah, when, when the time comes, when we're working at the right time in the right manner, we're, we're actively working on those now and have been for some time. This is, it's, as you said, it's our wheelhouse. And, you know, back in after 2011, uh, excuse me, 2001, you know, we helped Governor Jeb Bush get people. Uh, we recommended $20 million we spent uh, to advertise that helped tremendously back in the day in October of 2001 you could have taken a bowling ball rolled it down you know uh, Miami Beach and not hit anybody for three blocks vacancies were down to 17 percent lower at hotels but eventually that that uh, moratorium on flying was lifted and the money that tax was recommended plus some cost savings in the budget which are a little more short term helped us take it through back uh, some years later in 2008 nine tax which recommended things that the House and Senate acted on three bills that were done in special session in January 2009, saved $1.6 billion, avoided across the board cuts, and avoided tax increases. Those are the kind of things that we'll continue to do now, working constructively and uh, properly with the governor and legislature. So one question that was just asked was, why isn't there more urgency on this? Uh, when do you think is the, is the right time for the legislature to meet again to talk about the budget? Well, first thing is to, to see precisely what we have to address. I think the, the worst thing, and I kind of agree with, not I kind of I agree with the governor, you don't want to bring people to town without a roadmap. When we have, when former governors have fought and to, you know, the, the benefit of, of 40 years of experience, I've seen a lot. Not that I've seen everything, but I've certainly seen a lot. And I've seen governors bring legislators, legislatures into town without having a specific plan and it never turns out well. So part of it is no, what, how deep is the problem, when, where, and how can that be addressed? And that's part of what is being done now is assess with some reasonable degree of certainty. So I'm pleased to see some of the updates from the Senate President, Bill Galvano, of tax, which is working with the House and Senate uh, leadership, but especially with uh, our governor and cabinet to make sure that we give them, you know, the best advice that we've had developed over four decades of serving the long-term interests of the taxpayers of Florida. You, you mentioned some of the federal programs that are out there, and some of them have run out of money already. Mm -hmm. um, what other kind of stimulus programs do you recommend that the federal government introduce? Well, I think the, the, the biggest one really is, is they're, they're going for the second uh, pet program protection uh, uh, act, and I think that's going to help. I mean, it was a big, big hit. It was designed to help a lot of small businesses. Of course, it also helped some very big chains. We saw where some were getting $10, $20, 30000000 million. Um, so because of the way it was arranged, it was like 10 million per location. So if you got three, you could get that much. So some of that was not really the intention there. Um, I think I would have re redirected some of the money of $1,200 per person where it might've been needed a little better, but more importantly, the most important thing is keeping businesses that are the heartbeat, small businesses, which are the heartbeat of America, which are the heartbeat of Florida, alive and sustainable. So I think what you're going to see is not an all or nothing. Uh, we've been part Florida tax, which has been participating with others, working with governors reopen task force, um, finding what's the right balance between 
health and safety and, and economic uh, recovery. And so it's not going to be one or the other. It's going to be a you know, proper, safe, and thoughtful reintroduction of economic activity where it's safe, where it can be controlled and contained. And then we begin to learn with a little bit of a new normal. And hopefully with well, a year from now or less, we may be a little bit closer to to a full, full new, new normal. But like most of the experts are saying inside and outside Florida, the full normal is going to be when people have reduced that that fear factor that, you know, they won't uh, they won't be seriously ill or even worse. So I think until we have a true full time vaccine or medical intervention that could substantially reduce the the death uh, component or the very serious illness component of it, there's still going to be that, that that concern. But we are learning. Florida has been very fortunate, very blessed, but also, frankly, been led properly to minimize what was anticipated far, far greater uh, contagion and far, far greater number of deaths because we have abided by the separation, uh, social distancing, physical distancing, you know, hand, it, uh, hand it, sanitation alike. And also we mobilized our hospitals, our hospitals, public hospitals, or even a for-profit, all of our hospitals and safety and hospitals have really worked very, very well to, to kind of gear up, prioritize. And now we can begin slowly, thoughtfully, based on the evidence, begin to reopen Florida in ways so, that are safe and healthy and sustainable. So with everybody sitting at home for two and a half months or whatever it ends up being, um, a lot of things will be different uh, when we come out of this. Um, if we had a chance to reinvent Florida's economy or the, we reinvent the way we do business, looking at the other cycles that you've seen and also the, mm -hmm. the differences with this one, what would be a couple of your recommendations for, for Florida businesses and how we kind of reinvent the economy going forward? Well, obviously, we're going to do more remotely no matter what. I mean, we've seen that just because of the advances, but we've also learned that when things get better, and it's not going to be for a while because even after the fear factor may go, there's going to be a lot of corporate budgets that say, look, we kind of got used to this, these Zoom you know, meetings, these go-to meetings, these conference call meetings and the like, which get at much of what you're trying to accomplish. So some travel will be less seen as essential. But a lot of that just happens over time. You know, We say we'll never forget, but history repeats itself. We often do in time. But I think short term, there's going to be a whole change in commercial real estate. There's going to be a whole sense of doing business a little bit differently. We're going to find out that maybe we don't need as many support personnel as we once had. We're going to rely on technology a little bit more. Those are good things, but we're going to have to retrain people knowing that so that they can do other jobs that are still dramatically needed to fill the economy of the present in the next 5, 10, 20 years. Uh, one last big question. You're, you've been a big proponent of um, or big promoter of the 2020 census. Tell us um, what we should all be doing related to that. I filled out my form online. Yeah, I joke say fill out two, three times. Just make sure you get it right. Uh, no, Florida Tax, which has been a big promoter of, of uh, every Floridian county. But make sure make sure Florida counts. And tell us uh, why that's important. It's so important. And we have 22 million Floridians. Um, in 2010, we, we underestimated, or undercounted, or didn't fully count uh, as many as 1.3 million uh, Floridians. Now, not a total undercount, but it, but that has an impact of tens of billions of dollars uh, over the years. In fact, some estimates, you know, uh, two to five billion dollars each year. So why is that important? Because the census not only has been required in our U.S. Constitution since its founding in 1790, um, in fact, uh, later, our, our third president, uh, Thomas Jefferson, was in charge of the census in 1790. It's really important because it helps allow states, the state of Florida, which is the third largest, likely to gain at least one, maybe two congressional seats. If we do a full count, we might be able to count three. That's so important because now we have stronger representation in the U.S. House of Representatives. Two, it's also the basis upon which we, we can properly align the 120 seats in the Florida House of Representatives and the 40 seats in the Florida Senate and all of our 67 counties, all of our uh, 4 to 500 municipalities and uh, our school districts. So it helps us in geographic representation. It helps us, A, B, it helps us get tens of billions of dollars from several hundred federal grants and aid programs that, that distribute somewhere between one to one and a half trillion dollars a year. Florida often is shortchanged being number 48th, 
47th to 49th out of the 50 states, that's inexcusable. Part of it is because we are a fast growing large state. If we counted everybody today, which we're not going to, no one bats a thousand, we still, because we're growing so much faster, even particularly after this pandemic, we're growing at a, at a rate that's almost a thousand people a day. Okay, so that's 365,000 a year. Just assume it's only a quarter of a million. In five years, that's two and a half million people in Florida, which we're not getting any federal funds for. Okay, so no matter how good a job we do, we're always going to be behind the eight ball. So we need to minimize that. Instead of getting shortchanged 14 to 15 billion dollars a year, we want to reduce that by, you know, maybe five billion. So we'll only get shortchanged 10. But the key is it means billions of dollars for education, roads, um, early learning, public health, Medicaid the things that are vital for a healthy, civil, and prosperous society of Florida. And Floridians deserve nothing less than the best. Great. Well, I'll, I'll end on the positive note there. Thank you so much for, um, for weighing in from your home. Uh, do you have any other final comments? Uh, Bill, I want to thank you for your longstanding service, uh, both in, in uh, Tampa, Hillsborough, but also throughout the state, if not the, the Southeast. You've been a great uh, contributor and leader in our country and our state. And uh, Appreciate your service on the tax watch board and also serve with you on the Florida House board. So thank you for your yeah, gonna, continued public service. We're going to officially turn that into Florida's embassy. For anybody who doesn't know, uh, yes. Florida is the only state that has an embassy in Washington, D.C. And so uh, we, uh, we'll, we can talk about that offline, too. All right. Thank you thank so you. much. Uh, thank uh, you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.